there's growing global alarm over Omicron. This is likely to pose a very high global risk, and some regions will face severe consequences. We are deeply disappointed by the decision of several countries. They insist the focus should be on ensuring everyone in the world has access to vaccines. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. Here are the media stories we're examining this week. Uncertainty makes a comeback. What audiences need to know about the new COVID-19 variant and what they've been getting from their news sources. A Russian state-funded news network threatens to sue an independent media outlet in a branding dispute over a T-shirt. It's called Hallyu, the South Korean soft power push that's producing one blockbuster after another. And from East Jerusalem to the United Nations. I do not care whom this terminology offends. A journalist on why terminology matters in the coverage of the Middle East conflict. It has been 10 days now since the latest variant of COVID-19 was first reported by scientists in South Africa. The World Health Organization instantly labeled the strain it calls Omicron a variant of concern due to questions over its transmissibility and whether it could render vaccines ineffective. The initial reporting had many scientists accusing journalists of jumping the gun, creating panic in audiences that required information instead. There have also been complaints over the terminology, the early use of the term South African variant, implying that Omicron originated there when there is simply no evidence of that. Yet the South African angle has provided one useful side effect. It has turned attention to the issue of global vaccine inequity, a story that scientists say needs considerably more attention than news outlets have been giving it. Our starting point this week is the COVID-19 variant now known as Omicron. The new Omicron variant of coronavirus is likely to pose a very high global risk. News consumers operate on a need-to-know basis. There's growing global alarm over Omicron, the new coronavirus variant that first emerged in South Africa. Sometimes news outlets tell them what they need to fear instead, who they need to fear. The new mutations were first discovered in South Africa, prompting the U.S. to announce travel restrictions from that country and seven others. What audiences need to know about the variant we now call Omicron starts with three questions, the basics. What we need to know about a variant is if it's more transmissible. We're not even sure yet that it's more transmissible or that cases are rising exponentially in South Africa. We are joined by Skype by Dr. Angelique Kutia. Second, is it more virulent? The South Africa medical health officer, Dr. Kutsi, has been on the news now steadily for several days, saying that she does not think that this is a more virulent variant. But the majority of what we are, are presenting to primary healthcare practitioners are extremely mild cases. And then number three is, is it resistant to the vaccines? But there isn't evidence of that either. There won't be that much to say for days and weeks because it just takes time to get really good answers. So I think news organizations are in a really difficult situation here. And it's the expectation that if it is more transmissible, it will spread globally, but it's too early to say at this point. And so for instance, I was on, on Deutsche Welle the last four days every day to find out how concerned exactly we should be, we really have to, to wait. We have to... And every day I gave them the same answers. We're going to have to wait the next days and weeks to find out you know, which of these fears are actually going to be true. I have seen quite a lot of criticism, both from journalists and scientists, that the story has been overblown. Oh, John, this is scary. It really is. Uh, that it's the sort of scale of coverage is potentially causing panic. It's not hard to imagine how you know media watchers will react in a couple of weeks if uh, the worst case scenario with this variant is not met. And then while there'll probably be some hand wringing about the, the the sort of volume of that early coverage. South African scientists first reported the detection of the new variant to the World Health Organization on Wednesday, November 24th. It took two days, two 24-hour news cycles, for the WHO to label the variant Omicron. During that initial period, news organizations had to decide what to call it. Variant first detected in South Africa would have been precise, 
but try fitting that into a headline. So some called it the South African variant. Then came the travel restrictions imposed on South Africa and some of its sub-Saharan neighbors by more than 50 countries. It was only after that that we learned that Omicron turned up in the Netherlands in tests taken before the ones in South Africa, samples that just took longer to process. So it could have been called the Dutch variant. It never was. In South Africa, this came as no surprise because we've been through this before. The South Africa variant is very concerning right now. With the bitter variant, it was also labeled a South African variant. Joining us now to talk more about the South African variant. The South African strain. And we learned at that time how to dispel that, pushing back against that kind of label. And then countries in the global north that, um, you know, detected this um, variant were not subjected to these bans. And the question was raised, why is it that they are not introducing travel bans? The coverage was so hyped up, was so panicked, was so all over the place and Western scientists were hyping this up. This is the most transmissible variant we've ever seen. This is exponential growth prior to analytically looking at the situation um, and South African scientists and leaders right now. So essentially, they did their job. They did careful surveillance work and what they got in return was an immediate travel ban. There's been a huge backlash against South Africa. The scientists, they have taken to heart the, the lessons of this pandemic, which is we need to act really early. I was talking to one of the researchers who did this work, and he says that because the planes have been stopped, he's having trouble now to get the reagents that he needs to do the lab work that the whole world is waiting for now to understand how dangerous this variant really is. So these travel bans have a really, really dangerous effect. That accounts for over 70% of- The emergence of Omicron has put the issue of vaccine inequity where it belongs on the news agenda. 60% of people across the European Union are vaccinated. Compare that to a mere 3.4% across the African continent. Scientists have long warned low vaccination rates create conditions in which new variants can develop and thrive. There is no evidence, and there may never be, that South Africa's vaccination rate, just 24% at the time Omicron was first reported, helped create the variant. But fear of unvaccinated South Africans traveling will have factored into the restrictions. Sub-Saharan Africa is part of a global South that has struggled to get enough doses, outbid by richer countries that have also allowed pharmaceutical companies to keep their vaccines patent protected, preserving their profits rather than waiving those patents and allowing other companies to produce their vaccines during a worldwide emergency. President Biden got a letter in March 2021 from major pharmaceutical companies saying don't do this, this is not helpful for our profits. And then after that, the Trade Commissioner of the United States said that they're interested in working on waiving patents and then nothing happened. I think the media has a huge role to play to not just allow statements to sit on the surface, but to keep on digging and to ask world leaders why they haven't substantively moved with the WTO to change the situation around IP waivers. The virus will mutate as long as it's got the opportunity to spread from one person to the next, which is why it's critical that um, we get vaccines across the world, because in those regions we are creating opportunities for the virus to continue to spread. The story is not complete when you're just looking at Omicron without putting it in the context of vaccine inequity. The job of news organizations is to put global vaccine inequity onto the agenda. Politicians tend to really respond to the stories that rise to the top of the news cycle and really capture public interest um, and kind of become unavoidable stories. And, and to ask politicians about it and to interrogate the stakes of not doing something about it. That's, that's the role that news organizations can play. Well, Omicron has also reintroduced elements of uncertainty into the coverage of a pandemic that reporters appeared to be getting a handle on. News outlets did not make their reputations by telling audiences what they do not know. It still does not come naturally to them. And the variant has provided another opening for conspiracy theories, many of them made in America, now making the rounds in South Africa. 
They are theories that travel, and they have proved to be much harder to ban than people. The thing that shocks me the most is how mainstream media has become a, an outlet for conspiracy theories, for really wild and inaccurate statements in a way that I hadn't perceived before. They've created a problem that can never actually be solved, so they can justify whatever it is they want to do. I, I wonder whether I can stay being an infectious disease reporter without also becoming a misinformation reporter, a reporter on the information ecosystem. In the past, misinformation myths, they used to be localized. Now they are of global proportion. A lot of people that are driving misinformation in South Africa are using videos and recordings of people from all sorts of places in the world. I will not be reduced to a mere guinea pig by getting vaccinated with an experimental drug. People who drive these agendas and campaigns are actually causing harm, and some people need to pay a price for it. As long as there's no accountability, it's not going to stop, but it will continue to cause harm, and lives will be lost because of it. Looking at other media stories on our radar this week with Flo Phillips, we're turning to Russia, where the news network funded by the Kremlin, Russia Today, is threatening to sue another news organization over a T-shirt. Not just any T-shirt, Richard. This story is all about who made it and what they put on it. It's a collaboration between the Russian-language online newspaper Medusa, based in Latvia, and a Moscow-based clothing brand. You'll see that they've printed the phrase Inno Agent, that's foreign agent in Russian. It's basically an ironic reference to Medusa's official status in Russia, foreign agent, imposed on them by the government six months ago. There were lots of headlines in the run-up to the September elections about President Putin, his close allies and corruption allegations. Medusa's reporting on those stories resulted in it being slapped with the foreign agent label. They've left it much more open to prosecution by the state, limiting the way that it can publish and advertise, and of course, scaring off potential sources. It's really hurt their revenues, so they've been looking for other ways to keep afloat. Hence the t-shirt, but how do we get from there to RT threatening to sue? It's about branding Richard and the swag. Back in 2017, RT, the Russian state-owned news channel, was forced by the Trump administration to register as a foreign agent in the US. That's when they came up with their own line of merch. T-shirts, hoodies, caps, all saying foreign agent. But when Medusa did the same thing, RT somehow failed to find it very funny. It's hit Medusa and the clothing company with cease and desist letters, demanded that they be fined, and threatened to sue over trademark infringement. So where does the story go from here, into the hands of the lawyers? Well, Medusa was already under a lot of pressure from the Russian state before RT started piling on. That's why they're in Latvia, safer working conditions. So they've stopped selling the T-shirt. But the clothing company, they're not backing down. They're still selling the shirt and they're promising a 30% cut to Medusa. And it's proving popular on Russians' Christmas lists. The company says it's struggling to keep up with demand. Okay, thanks, Flo. Go back a few years. Had you asked a typical millennial what they knew about South Korea, the answer would have been, not much. That has changed. Not through news coverage or geopolitics, through entertainment. Start with K-drama, series that you can stream, like Squid Game and Hellbound, bingeable formats, slick production techniques, romantic storylines. Whatever the secret formula is, South Korea is now producing some of the world's most watched content. And K-drama is just one sector within the K-entertainment industry. It also takes in music and churns out K-pop bands and teen idols with huge followings overseas. About 20 years ago, coming out of life under military rule, the South Korean government placed a bet on the entertainment industry, pumping money into it as a means of improving the country's global image and boosting its economy. The plot twist that no one saw coming? That a soft power push would transform South Korea into a cultural superpower. The Listening Post's Johanna Hoos now from Seoul on what they call the Korean wave. They've been spotted in Moscow, Tokyo, Abu Dhabi, Sydney. But if you've never watched Squid Game, you may have asked yourself, what are those dolls and those guards that keep popping up? And what's with the masks? 
The giant characters sprinkled around the world reflect the global reach of Netflix's biggest series ever, with more than 110 million viewers. It's a story that follows contestants playing a game for money with deadly consequences, and it's the latest South Korean creation to find a huge international audience. They call it K-drama, and it's part of an export industry success story that even Koreans didn't see coming. 하루 만에 시리즈를 다 몰아서 봤는데 이제 다음 시리즈를 궁금하게 만들 수밖에 없는 그 연출이나 편집 구성이 흥행 요소 중에 하나였다고 생각합니다. 네, 저도 우리나라 드라마가 해외에서 이렇게 인기가 많다는 것이 정말 신기하고요. 이런 현상이 언제까지 지속될지는 모르겠지만 앞으로도 계속 발전해서. Studio Dragon is South Korea's largest production house and the force behind many of K-drama's biggest global hits. One of the reasons that K-drama became so popular worldwide is its diversity of genres like thrillers, action and comedy. But I think the biggest factor is our attention to storytelling. There is an element of Korean emotiveness embedded in the stories and this may appeal to audiences abroad. For example, in our drama Crash Landing on You, a South Korean woman accidentally lands her parachute in North Korea and then falls in love there. The story portrayed Korea's uniqueness and became a global success. If you look at Korean productions over the years, the content is always very distinctly Korean. It reflects our society and history. For example, Squid Game combines a game show genre that is familiar to a global audience with a mix of authentic Korean elements. Even more fascinating is a drama like Hometown Cha Cha Cha. This series has all the cliches of a Korean drama and wasn't intended to be distributed globally. Nevertheless, it's not only loved in Asia, but all over the world. Whether it's the emotive plot lines, slick production style, or formats tailor-made for binge-watching, K-drama has audiences around the globe in the millions. Shows like Stranger, Crash Landing on You, or Descendants of the Sun have put South Korea on the entertainment map, and their success is rubbing off on other industries. Films like Parasite, which won the 2020 Academy Award for Best Picture, and the music sector, boy bands like BTS, are all part of the so-called Hallyu phenomenon, the spread of Korean pop culture from Asia to the rest of the world. The term Hallyu emerged in the Chinese press in 1997 to describe the surge of Korean pop music and TV dramas in China. The term literally means the Korean wave in Chinese. And of course, more recently, the Hallyu has been increasingly adopted and used by Western media to refer to the rise of uh, K-pop and K-dramas. It's no coincidence that the Hallyu first hit China's shores in the 1990s. In that decade, following nearly 25 years of military rule and hit hard by the Asian financial crisis, a democratizing South Korea was set on reinventing its global image and diversifying its economy. The government in Seoul recognized the potential of entertainment. It scrapped censorship laws that had been in place for decades and set its sights on developing the culture sector that would turn into an export industry. South Korea was a military dictatorship from 1961 to 1987 during which people were oppressed and there was a thirst for freedom of speech. So when the democratic government replaced the military regime and censorship laws were removed, audiences flocked to the cinema to watch films from America, like Jurassic Park. The president at the time famously said that one spectacular film like Jurassic Park could be more profitable than selling 1.5 million Hyundai cars. Let us also cultivate this. The administrations since the 1990s offered several measures to develop cultural industries, 
subsidies, tax benefits, deregulation for private capital to invest. So it is undeniable that the government played an important role in developing the country's cultural industries in a relatively short period of time. However, Hallyu is far more than a top-down process. In fact, the initial rise of Hallyu is very much unpredicted. Even Korean government were very surprised. Surprised or not, since the 1990s, the South Korean authorities have capitalized on the popularity of its booming entertainment sector. Over the past two decades, Hallyu has grown into one of South Korea's most notable exports and a very productive part of the country's economy. But the entertainment sector is paying political dividends too. The government here in Seoul has recognized the potential of Hallyu as a diplomatic tool, part of a soft power push to increase South Korea's influence in Southeast Asia and beyond. South Korea has never had any hard power with which to threaten the world. What we do have is a certain cultural charm. For a long time, South Korea's image was mostly just about war, poverty, or a confrontation between North and South Korea. However, now that South Korea is being acknowledged for its popular culture, it is quite natural for the Korean government to utilize it as a soft power tool. Any other country would want to do the same. Korean celebrities have often been invited to government diplomatic events. One of the latest examples would be members of K-pop group BTS, who accompanied the Korean president to session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Another example is state visit to China in 2017, when K-drama star Song Hye-kyo accompanied the president at a Korea-China event. The government anticipated that the appearance of Song, who is exceptionally popular in China, can contribute to reducing the political tension between the two countries. It has been part of national branding and cultural diplomacy. But Brand Korea would not be where it is today without a helping hand from the entertainment industry's newest players. Streaming services like Netflix and Viki, whose audiences around the world have turned Hallyu from a regional phenomenon to a global one. In the beginning, we at Studio Dragon did not aim for our content to go global. In fact, for a long time, most production houses were based in-house, merely creating content for local Korean broadcasters. However, streaming platforms like Netflix allowed us to present our series to the world and to become well known. And as Squid Game shows, there is clearly quite a craze for Korean content. And the Korean entertainment industry is riding that wave of popularity with bingeable TV series, award winning films, and blockbuster music. Squid Game is just the latest soft power conquest for Korea. K-drama fans around the world are staying tuned for what comes next. And finally, from making your name by reporting over Instagram to telling it like it is at the United Nations, Mohammed El Kurd is a Palestinian whose journalism we featured before on our program. His Instagram was one of the must-follow feeds during Israel's ethnic cleansing of Al-Qurd's neighborhood in Jerusalem, Sheikh Shara, earlier this year. Having used social media to tell stories many other reporters failed to tell, using terminology others shied away from, Al-Qurd broke some unwritten rules. He has since been made the Palestine correspondent for The Nation, the American magazine that focuses on politics and culture, and he's done it all by age 23. This week, the UN brought El Kurd to New York to speak, part of the ceremonies marking the UN's International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. From the podium, he touched on the issue of terminology and why it matters in the reporting of what is happening in Palestine. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Hello, international community. Um, thank you for these groundbreaking speeches. I'm sure the occupation authorities are really concerned right now. My name is Mohamed Al-Kurd, and I am here to deliver a speech. 
I am tired of reporting on the same brutality every day, of thinking of new ways to describe the obvious. The situation in my neighborhood, Sheikh Jarrah, is not hard to understand. It is a perfect microcosm of settler colonialism. You know, when we reflect on history's most horrible, most inhumane atrocities today, we think of them with so much moral clarity. So much moral clarity that we tend to forget that when these atrocities were happening, they were perfectly legal. Not only perfectly legal, but at the time that they were happening, they were all once controversial, contested, too complex. People talked with neutral language like we do today. We all think that had it been us there back then, at that point of time, we would have been at the right side of history. And we have that opportunity today to be on the right side of history.